Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Gary Gray, Director of Athletics at East Stroudsburg University. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar entitled Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in College Athletics, A Call to Action. And I know we have some teams watching today, so shout out to ESU women's basketball team and uh, I think maybe another team, but I'm not 100% sure, but thanks for the teams joining in uh, collectively. Today's program is the eighth in a 12-part series that East Raspberry University Athletics will host between March of 2021 and February of 2022, with one speaker or set of speakers per month addressing the same topic, uh, each in their own unique and personal way. Uh, we know we need to continue to make progress on diversity, equity, and inclusion in college athletics, and we look forward to hearing and discussing the ideas shared by each of our presenters. I also want to remind you that each speaker's presentation is archived on our ESU Athletics website, so you can go back and watch anytime you wish or even share previous programs with friends, and I know they've received a lot of hits on those when people are, uh, are available and, and able to watch the full, uh, the full program. East Strasburg University is a diverse institution. Uh, where diversity, equity, and inclusion are sincerely valued. We have the highest percentage of uh, uh, non-white uh, undergraduate students in the entire Pennsylvania system. So we're very, we are diverse. However, we all recognize much more can be done, not only locally, but also within our state, within our country, and even globally to improve our society in so many ways. We know we can do better and we will. To cause change, action must occur. To cause action, discussions must occur. Ideas must be shared and commitments to change must be made. It is with this idea in mind that we have created this speaker series. During today's presentation, you are invited to send in questions or comments by way of the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Those will go directly to Mr. Noah Strone, Coordinator of Athletics Operations at ESU. When our speaker has concluded his remarks, Noah will serve as our moderator by sharing those questions or thoughts or comments that you send in and, and our speaker will uh, comment or answer questions or address whatever you raise in the chat. Uh, your questions will be anonymous so your name won't be shared. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nancy Jo Greenewald, Associate Athletic Director for Student Athlete Success, Senior Woman Administrator and Professor at East Stroudsburg University, who will introduce today's very special guest speaker, Dr. Greenwald. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a Friday afternoon, but we have a real special hour, I think, ahead of us. So I want to first and foremost say, you know, today's speaker is Michael Baysmore. He's currently the Athletic Director at Montana State Billings. But he is someone who has a connection to our area. He grew up in Philadelphia, but he did leave Philly to attend Michigan State University, where he was a four-year letter winner and football scholarship recipient. Based on his career there, he was able to pursue four years in professional football, which primarily was in the Arena Football League. From there, he went to Montana, Montana State Billings for his first stint, where he was obviously involved in many of the day-to-day -day operations and activities within the athletic department. He also, though, in 2016, did leave Montana State to pursue opportunities at other NCAA Division II institutions to certainly broaden his expertise and abilities. From there, um, Prior to his return to his current position, he spent three years at the NCAA National Office, where he was the Assistant Director of Academic and Membership Affairs, and he also was involved with NCAA bylaw interpretations and the processing of legislative relief waivers. So he certainly has a role in compliance, which makes sense because he's an active member in the National Association of Athletics Compliance. And he's also though an active member in the Minority Opportunities Athletic Association, where he serves on the planning and education development committees. His experiences no doubt throughout his career thus far have impacted who he is today. And I think it's for that reason, that it really is with great anticipation that I welcome him as today's speaker. So welcome, Michael, it's good to have you. Thank you, I appreciate that great introduction. Thank you, Dr. Gray for having me included into this series. Thank you, Dr. Greenewalt, for that great introduction. Thank you, Noah, for doing everything behind the scenes and coordinating everything 
And I just want to thank you all for number one, taking the initiative to, to start the discussion, to continue the discussion. I think it's a, it's a great thing that you all are doing this and hopefully we can continue this and it can maybe be a trend for another institution to kind of pick up the series in the, in the following academic year. And so you, you definitely heard of my, my background and whatnot, and we can kind of walk through some of those steps and hopefully I can shed some light in terms of how I got to, to this particular place in time. But honestly, it, it was, it took some, some intentionality, but a, a lot of things kind of happened just by happenstance. And I think maybe one of the biggest things you kind of see the outline there and we'll talk through and, and walk through kind of that journey that the biggest thing that I always get the question is, how did I end up in Montana? How in the world did that happen? And, and the funny thing is me being open to new opportunities. You know, I knew that I wanted to continue my football career and I'll jump, I kind of jump around in, in my story slightly, but I'm not one that scares easy. So when I got this Facebook message and this is old school Facebook, you know, this is not the new age Facebook where everything has all these different apps and everything. It was pretty rudimentary. And so there was a recruiter that was sending out some messages and recruiting for an indoor football league. And he sent me a message. And first I'm thinking it was spam or something like that. And then so I, I look into it and he's asking about this team in Montana and kind of what am I doing after college? And so we get to talking and he presented the opportunity to me. And this was in 2007. And I didn't even know where Montana was. And so before we had the fancy phones, I went and got a map. Yeah, so if anyone in, in, in this is group chat or on this, um, on this particular Zoom feed is, is younger than me, you may be surprised that yes, we use maps and atlases and map quests uh, back in the day to get around. So I look at the map and I'm like, I'm like man, that's a far place. <laughs> and so when I spoke to my mother and my father, I just, you know, kind of wanted to get their feedback in terms of, you know, what should I do? Because I had a decent job. I was working as a recruiter for information technology firm at the time. Uh, great people, like really great people. I think I've, I've been always fortunate to work with and around some really quality individuals. So I think I've been kind of lucky in that regard but you know after speaking to my parents they figure you might as well go out there you know while you still can physically play play the game that you love before you kind of look back and you wish you had took that leap of faith that leap uh take that opportunity so for me sports has always been the bridge when we talk about diversity equity and inclusion you know sports and football has always been something that was always commonplace for me that allowed me to break into other demographics, to you know, work side by side with other individuals. And so it's something that I always, always enjoyed about sports. You know, football was the sport that, I, sport that I excelled at, but you can also imagine when I get to Montana, you know, there weren't a lot of individuals that looked like me, right? And so I'm going from Philadelphia that was very diverse and going to Montana that was a, a very homogenous community. But one thing that was quite unique to, to me coming to Montana, I had a chance to experience a, another um, ethnic, ethnic background and, and, and race, and that's the, the Native American population, which we don't have a huge population in Philadelphia. So it was, it was pretty uh, interesting and unique to be able to experience that culture when I moved to Montana. And so I've always just kind of, you know, been one to observe a lot. And it was pretty cool to experience that. And so when I, I get to Montana, just learning the ropes and everything. And little did I know that the arena football business is, is pretty cutthroat. And so I'm, I'm glad I was pretty good because I've seen a lot of individuals come out to Montana and be cut within several days. Some maybe even like a couple hours, they weren't good enough. You know, sub, you know, maybe last a couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm glad I was good enough to kind of show them proof because I quit a job. I packed up everything and I moved to Montana and I was like, we're going to go all in and guns are blazing. You know, this, we're going to make this work to be 
So the failure is not an option in that regard. But the, the biggest thing that was interesting about playing for the Billings Outlaws was there were a lot of individuals from all across the country. I'm talking California, Florida, from the Midwest, you know, Michigan, even Texas, Ohio. So a lot of different individuals from a lot of walks of life. And so we are in Montana. And so we're experiencing obviously, uh, you know, a lot of the same things of, you know, just kind of being um, of the minority. But the cool thing about it is having that bridge of football, right? And so one thing about this community, they love their sports, they love football. And so with the arena football, you know, you are paid, but the thing about it is you're not paid an exuberant amount of money like the NFL. So you have to, you know, get a part-time job in the community. And I think that helped, um, honestly, you know, break down some barriers, break down some walls where now you're of the community, you know, you're playing a sport that, pe playing a sport that people, for the most part, is a very popular sport. So that naturally gravitates people to, you know, you know, want to uh, meet you and speak with you, but then now you're working side by side with them, you know, at, at whatever job that you're, you're working. And so now you're, you know, starting to have some of those conversations. And sometimes you have to really understand when you're moving to or you're living in a community that is pretty homogenous, sometimes maybe their only experience, maybe, you know, what they see on TV, maybe what they see in whatever news outlet that they they choose to to take in and so they have a lot of questions so i think when you are able to kind of maybe uh, break down some some myths or maybe some stereotypes i think that definitely definitely helps and you know we were fortunate to win several championships for the city of billings and you know they were uh very appreciative of that you know we have always gotten a lot of support it's, it's weird because even to even to this day you know somebody will randomly just kind of stop and just kind of, you know, thank me for, you know, kind of the, the teams we had and the success that we had and just bringing uh, a lot of life to, to the city of Billings and, you know, kind of um, Billings is definitely on the map, you know, but, you know, making sure that we do our best to, um, to let people know of that. And so being around a lot of successful people, you know, from the owners to other teammates, I think that always kind of made me think, what was my next step going to be? And I think this, was the perfect step for me. It was exactly what I needed because coming from Philly, East Coast, it's very fast paced. You know, you're very reactionary. And so when you step out of that environment, you have a chance to kind of uh, debrief more. It's a slower pace of life. And I think, you know, moving to Montana was exactly what I needed because I was able to kind of just think long-term of what I wanted to do uh, outside of just playing football and kind of reassess a lot of things and, and you know what did I want to get in terms of enjoyment out of life and so that was I mean, Montana has been a place that I've always you know had an affinity for I think when I moved away um, my first time so started in 2007 and then we'll kind of go through some of the other stops I had and I left in 2006 so you know nine and a half years uh, it's quite some time especially as a, as a young adult it's a, a very key part in my upbringing and in, in my maturation. And yeah, it's just a, a place that I think I maybe had slightly took it for granted when I left it the first time, but I was definitely very pleased to have the opportunity to come back. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll move, move on to the next slide and kind of jump into the background. So yeah, as Dr. Greenwald spoke earlier, you know, I'm from Philadelphia, born and raised in Philadelphia. I'm a, I'm a Philly Philly boy through and through, uh, born in the North Philadelphia section, uh, the Strawberry Mansion uh, area in particular, and have a huge family, right, a huge family. And one thing I always tell people, even though you may look at uh, some of the, you know, the news feeds, and, you know, there are some things that definitely the community has to work on now, but when I grew up, it was always a lot of love, like a great community. And so even though, you know, it has its challenges and any inner city does, uh, you know, when you're dealing with uh, a lot of oppression, you know, there can be definitely some strife. But what's not spoken on enough is the beauty that comes out of these communities, right? A lot of a lot of love. And that definitely takes a village in. Um, I, I wasn't aware of, of that village until, you know, you get in trouble. Uh, and so you think you're doing something and you're kind of on an island. I, I'm aware of my 
intermediate family, how big that is. And so if I don't see any of them, I think I can get away with some things. But little do I know that some of my neighbors are friends of my parents and grandparents. And so they're not going to let me stray or go down the wrong path because they look at me as, as one of their own. And so that, that was one of the things I learned at an early age is that, okay, well, it's but want to be bigger than just, you know, trying to get away with whatever silly things you think you can get away with as a kid. Um, so I learned that early on, but a lot of love, a lot of support. I never was ever discouraged. Uh, that's something, one thing I want to definitely speak to when you're dealing with inner city communities that there's always a lot of love, a lot of encouragement um, amongst, you know, kind of some of the challenges that we all face. And so from Philadelphia, I went to West Philadelphia Catholic High School see some of my pictures there. And then some years back, I was fortunate enough to, to be inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame. And the cool thing about that was, so when I played football, when I started, I didn't even know what a lot of the rules were. Like, I didn't know what a sack was. And so it's funny, one of my first tackles was a sack and my teammates are celebrating and everything. And I'm just like, okay, I know I did something good because I listened to my coach. You know, I was aggressive to follow instructions, so I know I was good there. But, you know, it took me a while to pick up some of the more nuanced things about the game. And I just kind of ex excelled at it um, kind of like naturally. It was kind of weird. But I always just kind of had this love and passion for the game. And, you know, as Catholic, when I when I got there, uh, I was still kind of a knucklehead. You know, Philadelphia, I knew a lot of things and haven't really been anywhere. I'm, you know, young, what, 15, 16 years old or whatnot. And so – when we went through a coaching change, my coach was probably one of the most instrumental coaches I had in my career because at that time I wasn't looking at college. I wasn't even looking at college per se. Like obviously it was an idea, but it was still kind of like, okay, how do you get there? How was how you going to afford to pay for all of those good things? And my head coach at the time, you know, I guess he saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. He kind of, you know, had one of those heart to hearts with me about you can really do something special with your talent. You know, you're able to probably do some things that you are not aware of. And so didn't quite fully understand at the time, but I knew if he took, if he took the attention and took the time to kind of pull me aside and, and speak to me in that tone, you know, I knew that, you know, I had to kind of take heed and then like look at some things more seriously. Um, but yeah, definitely love Philly. And from there, you know, I, I was recruited by a lot of schools and landed on, on Michigan State. And the interesting thing is when you're recruited, when you're being recruited, and this is back when I was being recruited, it's like late 90s. Uh, and so not as extravagant as it is in today's world and all the social media and Twitter. I'm glad I didn't have Twitter and Facebook and Instagram back then. Uh, <laughs> um, it's definitely a, a new a new challenge to the whole process, but I didn't know a lot. And so my coach, he took me around to a lot of schools that had interest in me so I can, you know, be on college campuses and kind of see that experience. I think that's another thing too, when you're coming from the inner city, just the exposure to a lot of different things, right? Having the access to some of those different areas, like being on a college campus. I know a lot of schools are doing, um, have started to do more to obviously bring those students on the campus so they can definitely just see different things, right? I think when you see things, you start to, you know, visualize and conceptualize and it helps, it helps that individual just kind of look at their world more broad. And so for me, it definitely opened my eyes to a lot of different things. And I, I, don't, I don't know if my mother would have let me stay. She, she would not have, uh, I was being recruited by Penn State uh, as well as some other in-state schools. But I think she wanted me to probably spread my wings and go to an out-of-state school just because, you know, maybe if things didn't go as planned in the beginning, you know, being a Division One athlete, probably easy to kind of come back to Philadelphia, maybe fall into some pitfalls as, you know, maybe some other family members, some some friends. And so I think it was, it was good for me to kind of get out of state. And, you know, when you're 10 plus hours away out of state, you know, you don't have a car, uh, probably really can't afford to uh, fly home. And so I think it makes you grow up more. It makes you deal with uh, the issues you may, you may, you may come into, you know, when you're a young adult, but my foundation was always strong, you know, from my family to my high school, 
And, you know, I went to a Catholic high school in the inner city. And so I think one of the misconceptions people have was that it was uh, a high school that was, you know, a one that you may see on movies and whatnot. But the funny thing is, it was pretty much like more similar to probably a traditional public school than I guess the traditional uh, private school. It just was a matter that we had uniforms on. And so we had some very hard nosed instructors that, you know, kept kept us all in line because I think they saw all the potential, not only in myself, but a lot of my classmates that went on to do you know, some great things and you know, Ivy League graduates. So I think I've always been fortunate to have a good foundation. And when I went to Michigan State, I think it was it was weird because the things that were common to me weren't as common to some of my other teammates that were from maybe some rural schools and in, in various areas, you know, from Virginia to Maryland to Florida. And so they were, they looked at me as someone that was um, pretty focused. And I was like, this is just kind of, you know, my standard. And so it was, it was interesting as a, as a young adult to kind of encounter just some of the differences and just people's upbringing from just an academic standpoint and, and a discipline standpoint. And so at Michigan State, you know, I, I went there, fortunate, was, uh, was fortunate enough to have a football scholarship and then I uh, was fortunate enough to be a starter. But one thing I did want to speak on, which is kind of when I got done, that disconnect that student athletes have. You know, we are so focused on our sport, you know, graduating, but there is a disconnect that student athletes go through because it's not really guaranteed what the next step is. You know, you do want to obviously pursue your, your, your degree, but sometimes, you know, you're in, you're in a degree and you may not know exactly if you want to work in that particular field. I know students are doing a better job of, of looking into the career paths you're going to be in once you, up, once you take up whatever degree path you do. Uh, but that was one that I, I went into school, you know, wanted to be a business major, uh, you know, wasn't quite strong enough academically to, to be admitted to the business school. So I had to take those credits, you know, thinking about progress toward degree, you know, what is so what is more similar that I can keep all these credits and progress and be eligible for the following year and kind of landed on a major that myself and my advisors agreed on. So landed on interdisciplinary studies, but I had a, so many credits doing that. I was able to get another bachelor's before I left because I was there for five years and registered in my first year. Um, but yeah, I really didn't know exactly what I wanted to do with that, but just kind of figured out to stay in that, that particular career path and kind of see what comes of it. But I wish I would have known about sports administration sooner because I definitely would have looked at that more, more closely. And who knows where I would be now if I would have started sooner in terms of uh, of that. And so, yeah, one thing I will advocate is just kind of maybe digging into, you know, your student athletes and, and, and their plans after they graduate, because there is kind of a disconnect because you're so used to your sport and that dictating a lot of your time and kind of that gives you that foundation when you don't have that foundation, you know, kind of what next. So talking through those steps and there is, there is life after the sport. I can uh, attest to that. And, and so that's one thing for student athletes that I think will still happen to having to struggle with. And so, yeah, in terms of how, how I got to, uh, to this particular position, man, it was kind of weird when I was, you know, playing ball in Montana, just kind of thinking about what I wanted to do for my next steps. So what are you going to do? Didn't want to, you know, play, excuse me, I didn't want to, didn't want to coach professionally. You know, I did have some more interest in in NFL in terms of how I was playing, but didn't really get another shot um, after I was playing arena football. So started coaching youth football and that made me think about things more holistically and somewhere or another, I knew I wanted to be in sports, but I knew I wanted to do some things kind of behind the scenes. And for me, I wanted to, you know, use my experience to help out, you know, the future generation that was gonna come behind me so they can hopefully use my experience to shorten their learning curve. And then, you know, from them, they take the torch passing on to the next generation. And then from there, you know, we can kind of make some strides uh, holistically. As I say, football is pretty much the platform, but really it's more or less just how do you get, you know, some people to be more positive in their community, you know, just kind of, you know, kind of uh, be someone that's better in society. Hopefully that's not too cliche, but use that as the platform to, to get there. And so, yeah, from a youth football coach to graduate school, and then I started an internship at MSUB, 
And then from there, kind of just um, got hired on staff. I started out as, as an SID, but the, as an SID, and I didn't even know a lot about covering sports and stats and stat crew and all of that, just kind of a lot. I was thrown into, uh, thrown into a lot and it was kind of a baptism by fire and whatnot. But from there, I knew I was, I was hungry to learn. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be an athletic director and I communicated that to, to my supervisors and, and whatnot. And so whatever they can throw at me, I was open and take on that experience. And from there, just kind of grew, went to several other D2 institutions. I went to Truman State, to uh, my, excuse me, Metropolitan State, Denver. And then from there in the national office, which is a pretty cool experience. Um, definitely one that I learned a lot. I grew on a lot with that experience. A lot of great people work at that facility. And it's just, I think I've been fortunate enough to, like I say, be around a, a lot of great people that's helped me uh, along my path. And so in terms of membership, this is my second stint here at MSUB. I uh, see there, I kind of um, am a homegrown product. You know, I've uh, had a lot of experience here. And I also have experience at other institutions, so I think helped me kind of come back and uh, earn this position that I'm currently in. And yeah, you see from intern, SID compliance, now may D, uh, but was definitely fortunate enough to, to be able to come back in this seat in this capacity. So hopefully I'm trying to, you know, pass the torch, excuse me, take up the torch and, and do some great things with that. But in terms of, you know, from a diversity, equity and inclusion standpoint, you know, I would like to ask just from a general standpoint as an organization, uh, as an association, NCAA, like, you know, what are we going to do, right? Are we have a lot of theoretical things in place but, you know, what are we going to do to really move the needle? You know, how are we going to be accountable for what the, the lack of diversity is within this profession? You know, how can, we, how can we be more intentional to address that? Right? I think that we all are running for the right reasons to help student athletes grow, to help our communities grow. But we have to be accountable. We have to be intentional with that right so I, my biggest question is you know what are we going to do are we going to be about it or are we going to you know move uh move the needle be be actionable i know that takes some time you know so we have to always continue to have that discussion be open about it be honest be patient you know try to dispel some things that uh we may bring into those conversations and just be open be really willing to listen right and so from there, you know, the time is now, you know, we talked about a lot of these things in terms of the subject matter for quite some time, but the time is now for us to, to act, right? We should not be um, hesitant to wait. And, you know, we always have to go back to, you know, why we got into this profession, you know, what we are here for. We're here for the student athletes, right? So we want to try to mirror our student athlete populations with the administration, the coaching staff, that is around them to support them. You know, it's just as important for uh, a young individual um, that, that happens to be white to see someone of a different um, gender of a different ethnic background that is in a, um, a supervisor's position. You know, so they are aware that yes, you know, um, they may have to report to someone that is of a different background. You know, how do you know you, how do you do that? Right. And so I think it's always key that we go back to, you know, why are we here? Why we want to see these programs progress? I mean, we're also aware that, you know, when diversity, equity and inclusion is done in a genuine fashion, it really works. Right. We're not talking about tokenism. Like when we actually sit down and be intentional about uh, these areas, it works. You know, it helps us. Overall, not just from just the organization productivity standpoint, but just from just, you know, from the people that are working there, right? We have to be mindful that there are people working in, working in these positions and the power is always going to be in that, you know, no matter, you know, who's sitting in these seats is always going to be a person. So the more that that person is educated and can be open to, uh, you know, genu genuinely attacking these, these issues, I think it helps helps us move that needle, helps us grow overall as a community, 
and as a society. And then in terms of, I guess, we're looking at it from an individual standpoint, you know, what can you do? You know, I'm, I've always been taught to, to lead from where you're at. So it doesn't matter what position you're in, you know, you can always speak to, to your supervisor about, hey, you know, um, we have a position that may be coming open or is open. You know, I have some, some of my, my colleagues that may be interested that, that are minorities. You know, I think having that, that resource and, and, and being able to, you know, lead from your position and, and absolutely reaching out to your contacts who, who may be uh, minorities of our positions. I think uh, it's been proven that, you know, minorities are willing to go to some areas that they may not, you know, see a lot of individuals that look like them, but they're, you know, willing and hungry to learn because they're very passionate about being in this, uh, being in college athletics. And so don't just dispel these individuals thinking that, oh, they're a minority, you know, they from, they're from a big city. They may not want to come to a smaller city um, with, you know, less people. Sometimes people are looking for that experience. So don't just discount them because, you know, they may be from a larger city, you know, get, get the chance to speak to them, you know, because the funny thing is we're more alike than we are different. Even though, you know, you may not have, for instance, in Billings, you know, obviously you have, um, you know, NFL teams in Denver and Major League Baseball teams, NBA teams in Denver and whatnot. But, you know, in terms of some of the other things, the day in and day out things you need, you know, we have those things in the community. You know, you have what you need. And so uh, don't just discount someone because they're from a larger city. And we have to be intentional. You know, I can remember vividly when I was uh, working as an SID and one of the ADs from our conference, they had a head uh, volleyball position that became available. And that AD pulled me aside and he's, he's quite frankly asked me, he's like, do you know any uh, minority candidates for this particular position. She's like, no, I want a minority candidate or several minority candidates in this position because I want to, you know, make sure my coaching staff is doing the best we can to be diverse, you know, for the benefit of this particular program, but the entire athletic department. So just being intentional and recognizing that, you know, you want to do your best to have minority candidates in your coaching pools. And then, you know, I'll, I'll give a shameless plug for the minority opportunities Athletic Association, this organization touches all facets of college athletics. So from two-year institutions, NCAA institutions, and AI institutions, we have administrators from every, uh, from all from all sectors, right? You don't have to be um, an AD, uh, communications, compliance, fundraising. You can be whatever position you are. You know, we bring all of those administrators together and, you know, we, we work on trying to improve uh, the landscape in college athletics. So you don't have to be a minority to be involved as a member of MOA. You know, yes, you can be of the majority. Uh, we do have uh, majority members on our board. And so that's one thing I wanted to uh, advocate for, for, for you to join MOA and, you know, be a part of those discussions, how we are looking to try to move that needle. And so you can see the, the website is there and I would um, definitely implore you to um, to go into the website and to, and to register and be a, be a part of the organization. I think I've, I've been a part of the organization since I want to say maybe 2013. I'm on the board as well. And, you know, I'm trying to do my part to make sure that, you know, I'm, I'm of the change when it comes to college athletics and, and, and being a part of that change. And I kind of I will kind of end the presentation uh, portion of this of this segment. Just kind of say it's my content information. You know, feel free to keep the conversation going. If there's questions you have about my background or just MOA, you know, feel free to email me or give me a call or text, and I'll be happy to kind of discuss that or anything when it comes to diversity, um, inclusion, equity. I'm you know happy to you know continue that discussion. You know, answer any questions you may have. You know, don't be scared to, you know, reach out to me, you know, I think, um, I think sometimes you may have questions and you may be scared to ask those questions, but I think when you ask those questions and, you know, it can help you kind of dispel some things as well. So I appreciate, you know, you all listening to my story. Um, hopefully you have some questions and we can kind of get some more conversation going about some things. Thanks, Mike. I'll, uh, I'll start it off. I know Noah uh, has a few there that he's going to assemble. And uh, while he's doing that, I actually have a couple, and Dr. Greenewalt might too. Um, what, 
what changes have you seen for the for the better uh, in the last, I'll say, 10 or 15 years, basically from the time maybe you were a student athlete, division one student athlete, you know, coming up through the ranks and now to the to the, your your position as a as a division two director of athletics. Have you have you seen some things that you, you kind of see we're getting right uh, that maybe we should capitalize on and do more of or or maybe I, I'll, I, I'll let you even maybe take it the opposite way. Maybe some things we're not doing well at all that we need to change. So either direction, but what, what changes have you seen kind of from when you were a student athlete to now where you're a director of athletics? Yeah, one of the biggest changes, and I think maybe I can be uh, slightly envious, is just like the student athlete voice and recognizing, I guess, how much how much power you have as a student athlete in that population. I think when when I was coming up as a student athlete, I guess we didn't really feel as though we had a strong voice mm-hmm. in terms of how we felt about just how we were being led from the administration standpoint. But I think that was a needed change, and, and I'm happy that that has um, that has happened throughout my time. Um, from being a student athlete to an administrator, the student athlete boys being very intentional to listening to the student athletes, putting actual legislation into place because of the of that student athlete voice yeah. and their power, I think is, is a beautiful thing. It's something that you know I applaud, I'm happy about. I mean, I'm not one that will uh, ever shy away from that, you know. I think we always have to keep in keep into um, our awareness, we are leading, you know, young men, young women from all walks of life. So we need their input, their inputs on how we are leading them. We know they're young, they're very impressionable, but they have some great things to say, some great ideas. So it's up for us to just kind of foster them and, you know, take into account, you know, how do we um, administrate and lead them in, in the right way and take into account all their voice. In terms of some things that we can do better, is, is probably maybe being more intentional about uh, maybe some of the the recycling of some of the coaches we have and administrators we have. I think that we should try to look at being more patient with some administrators that are looking to gain, you know, gain more uh, senior roles. They may not have, you know, one through 10 in the qualifications. Maybe they have one through seven. They can grow and be a great administrator. So I think giving some of those opportunities to, to you know, individuals that may not be, I guess, as uh, that don't check all those check marks and some of, you know, maybe the desirables, but they have exactly what you need to be successful. I think that's one thing we can always do better as, a, as an organization um, to, to look at that and try to be more intentional about that and giving chances to some individuals that, you know, definitely deserve it. Um, it's just a matter of us just being intentional about that. Yeah, thanks. And, and Mike, you did a really nice job of kind of outlining your progress, your road uh, that you traveled. Uh, has there, in that, has there been a key element or two that has really helped you progress? I mean, is it any, I know the NCAA has an amazing list lineup of leadership development opportunities. And I, I know, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but that's just one, one thing. But it, what, what has maybe been the most impactful to help you get where you are today? The most impactful, I would say uh, kind of twofold. I would say internally, I've always had supervisors and mentors that helped me along the way. Um, Krista Montague, uh, friend and mentor, she was the AD prior to, to me assuming this position. She was always very intentional in terms of including me on a lot of conversations when it came to upper management. Sure. And then in terms of my involvement with MOA, I was able to be around athletic directors, presidents, sure. chancellors from other institutions and having having a chance to just, you know, have conversations with them, I think was key mm-hmm. in my development. And then I think another thing is just being at the NCAA. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind of like a, um, a large professional development um, experience just because you're around a lot of highly intelligent, you know, highly experienced individuals mm-hmm. that were previous athletic directors, previous 
conference commissioners and so being able to being in meetings with them you know seeing how they think how they process problems gaining that skill set is is i think uh, invaluable and then yes i have been a part of a lot of professional development um programs with the ncaa you know the dr charles wickham uh, leadership academy mm -hmm. is one that i that was a part of i was a part of the d2 ada uh, mentorship program and so yeah i definitely was one that if the experience of program is out there, I'm going to figure out a way, you know, how to be a part of that. You know, I'm not going to uh, wait and sit back to be selected I'm, and be selected. I was always one that I'm going to be proactive and, you know, figure out a way that I can be a part of those programs. So I think that's one thing that I, I've always done was try to be very proactive and in being uh, included in some of those professional development opportunities. Good. Thank you. Very good. Uh, Dr. Greenwald, do you have anything or? Uh, no, I do have a few questions. Ahead. Okay, good. Let's go there. <laughs> then we'll go to Noah. All right. So, Michael, you've you've talked about some of the things that you've done in terms of being proactive on your own behalf to be involved. But if you were talking with um, minority and female student athletes at this point in time, and there are probably some on this call or will be listening to this. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have them if they want to pursue, you know, for them, so to speak, if they want to pursue a career in athletic administration or coaching? I mean, knowing that it's not an easy field to entry and to get that opportunity, you know, what other advice might you give them in addition to what you've already shared? It's going to be a tough road. I'll be honest. It's going to be a tough road. You're going to have to take a leap of faith. You're probably going to have to go to or move to an area that you probably never thought about moving or living in. So it's gonna take that leap of faith. It's gonna take some patience too. I know, and I can speak to it personally, you know, just kind of being, um, sometimes you get frustrated because you feel as though you're qualified, you feel as though you're very capable, but you know, yeah, you still may feel as though the progression didn't happen as quickly as you wanted to, right? And so I would just say have patience, but make sure that you are very intentional when you make your moves. You know, look into, excuse me, look into, you know, really dig into it on those interviews, you know, the individuals that you're going to be working around, right? Because you're going to be working with them for a lot of hours, a lot of days. And so you want to try to do your best. You know, it's not perfect to, you know, feel very comfortable that they're going to have your best interests at heart and you know i would say yeah try to you know be very poignant because even though you know you look at this opportunity and you know you want to jump at it you know sometimes you may have to vet it and and make sure it's the right opportunity for you to grow you know you want to, it's going to be uh, some reciprocity with that not only are you bringing value to that institution but that institution should be bringing value to you and so you have to, you know, make sure that, you know, that reciprocity is there. And yeah, I would say just preach patience. And even though, you know, starting off, um, you know, the, the salaries may not be the best uh, when you're working in some institutions. Um, and so don't worry too much about that. Obviously, yes, you have to, you know, keep into account your expenses. Um, but if you're working in an industry where you're passionate about it, I think that is going to give you more fulfillment overall. You know, if you can figure out the financials, you know, um, obviously you, you got to do that, you know, being in this society, but, you know, focus on your passions and then being patient and, you know, follow through, you know, follow through. Don't try to jump shit too fast. Follow through. Another question for you. Um, I'm a firm believer that our lived experience um, really impacts and frames who we are and how we lead. So I'm curious, based on your lived experience, you know, what are some of the things that you do on a daily basis that promotes the diversity, equity, inclusion? And maybe what are some of the practices or strategies that you're infusing into your uh, work based on your, your you know, new title and uh, the new challenges that you face as an athletic director? Absolutely. I would say the biggest thing in my experience is I've always been in a position where I felt like I had a voice. 
And so making sure that I'm intentional, that anybody I work with, I supervise for my student athletes is to feel as though they have a voice and that voice is gonna be respected. And, you know, we can, even if we know we may uh, disagree on certain things administratively, um, at least they feel as though that, you know, I, I respect their voice and I'm, um, you know, I'm working with them, you know, with a level of care, I think is the biggest thing. I think individuals want to know that you care uh, for them, you know, you care about their well-being. You don't just see them as um, this ancillary individual that, you know, um, you don't see their, your relationship as transactional. So I think the more you can pour into individuals and let them know that you, you generally care about, you know, their well-being, you know, their experience overall, I think uh, is going to definitely help them as well. And I incorporate that into my leadership because, you know, I've always been a part of organizations that, you know, I felt as though I really cared about my well-being. So I want to definitely extend that uh, while, I'm, while I'm here at, at MSUB. And I think the more we can do that, the, the better off we have. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. No, I think you've got some there from our uh, viewers. I guess it's my turn now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess just piggybacking on Dr. Greenwald's question there, you know, one of the questions we had from, uh, from the group here is, do you have any DEI trainings that you're currently doing now as AD at uh, MSUB? Um, or while you were kind of coming up even through the ranks um, at different universities that you had stops at? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I have not been in any training uh, recently, but I can speak to when our institution has, um, you know, trainings from a diversity, equity, inclusion standpoint, uh, when, it came, when it came to um, LGBTQ community, uh, we've had trainings at MSUB. I've been a part of trainings at MSU Denver. Can't recall if I've been a part of trainings at, at Truman or not. I think I probably was, but that's one where that's the entire institution. So I've always been in intentional about if there's something that I may not understand and there is training for all employees, I'm one and us always going to sign up so I can make sure that, you know, I am doing my part to make sure that I'm respecting everybody that I'm going to be working with um, at, my, at my institution. And so yeah, I think that's one where we have to continue to be uh, to be intentional about those trainings because there there can be a lot that you may take in from all kind of you know different avenues and areas. But I think having the the poignant training to you know have some uh, to kind of maybe dispel some things is going to help out everybody involved. You know, not just you as an administrator, but I think the students that you are caring for and, and overseeing. And so your training is, is key. And I've been fortunate to, you know, be at schools that have offered those trainings. And I've definitely been uh, one to, you know, be one of the first ones to sign up and just sit there and listen, you know, and just ask poignant, que poignant questions. And then from there, you know, take those training back to, you know, student athletes and to your, your fellow colleagues within your department. So, uh, so being a Philly, a Philly boy, do you miss Wawa? Somebody asked. <laughs> yes, I do. It's funny. Yeah. <laughs> when I go back home, I got to hit, you know, my, my go-to spots. And so yeah, definitely Wawa, you know, got to get a hoagie, soft pretzel. Got to go, got to go to Wawa from there, you know, got to get a cheesesteak. Um, I, I like Ishka Bibbles on South street, you know, the, the Los Angeles is definitely good, but you can get a, a good cheesesteak anywhere in Philly. And so I got to hit up my favorite, my favorite spots to get some of my favorite foods. That's awesome. Um, actually went into one of the other questions was, uh, are there any Philadelphia traditions, food or anything cultural that you can find in uh, Montana though, that reminds you of kind of home, you know, being Montana, maybe not as diverse as, uh, as downtown Philly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say um, not in my first stint per se, but now uh, Jersey Mike's, they make a pretty good cheesesteak for being, a, I guess, a, a, a larger kind of food chain. And I think Jersey Mike's is a, a pretty, uh, it does the Philadelphia cheesesteak justice. Normally when you know you have something that's so specific 
to Philly. And then when someone, you know, takes that and they um, give it out to the masses, it's just like, oh, they're not doing it right. But I think Jersey Mike's does the Philadelphia cheesesteak justice. So I'm, I'm happy to, to see that. It seems to be one of the, uh, the common questions are finding, you know, comforts of home or, or stuff like that when we talk about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is what, what reminds you of growing up or what reminds you of going home. So uh, as long as that is able to do that for you there, that's pretty good. Uh, I'll, I'll ask the last question here and then I'll have Dr. Gray kind of wrap it up. Um, the question is, how difficult was it for you to switch through different areas within the athletic department at MSUB? And then like, did you find this experience helpful, you know, across those multiple areas uh, to get to your current position as director of athletics? Who, uh, difficult? Um, I, I wouldn't say, I will say being at a division two school definitely benefited me because since you don't have larger staffs comparative to division one institutions, you're not siloed as much. And so you're always kind of uh, with an earshot or a thing, you know, a blink of an eye that you're probably going to be doing something that it may not be within your exact responsibilities and duties. It falls under the other duties as assigned. <laughs> and so I think I've been fortunate to work at all three division two institutions where I was able to kind of not only from a department standpoint, but from an institution standpoint. So being involved on committees and just kind of growing my awareness of a lot of the issues of a institution, being able to be in meetings with individuals from other departments and learning of some of those issues, you gain a broader perspective in how things uh, operate. So it hasn't been, I think, difficult in that regard. I think as long as you communicate what you want to do long term, hopefully the supervisors, and I'm fortunate to have supervisors that allow me to grow and allow me to, in a sense, push my growth, my development by either, you know, being a part of several uh, professional development opportunities and then, you know, giving me assignments that help me um, help facilitate that growth. And then I know I was promoted here at MSUB from communications to internal operations and compliance. And so you have to make sure that whatever your responsibilities are, you want to do your best to excel at those and show your supervisors that you have the capacity to learn in another role and to grow in another role. I think though you have to make sure that you work on those transferable skills because the actual job themselves, you can always learn those things. But the biggest thing is just having transferable skills that will help you be successful in some of these other roles. So I would say it hasn't been, I guess, difficult per se. Um, once you get the hang of things in that particular role, I think the, the biggest thing is just, you know, being patient with yourself to grow and to learn. Because when you're focused on these goals, you're focused on progression, you can see the light at the end of the tunnel, I think sometimes we can become very impatient because you want to get that experience, but, you know, being patient and, you know, enjoying the experience where you're currently at, because it does come very fast and the, and the progression happens before you even know it. And then you kind of look back and like, well, wow, it's been, you know, uh, 10 years, right? And I've done some pretty cool things along the way. So, you know, feel free to, you know, pat yourself on the back, enjoy, your work, you know, not get too comfortable, not get too complacent, you know, always have a, you know, a carrot or a goal that you are striving for, you know, you know, work to perfect your craft and then, you know, let the chips fall where they fall, you know, as they say. Well, Mike, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and comments with us here today on this very important topic. Uh, as we said earlier, uh, we have recorded this session uh, it's going to be viewed by and listened to uh, by many, many people down the road. So thank you very, very much. We sincerely appreciate it. Thank you for answering the questions and addressing the comments we received uh, from the viewers. Uh, Noah, Dr. Greenewald, thank you also for being part of today's program. As always, we really appreciate it. And finally, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today uh, to be part of uh, this ESU Athletic Speaker Series or 
in the future, if you're listening to the recorded version, we invite you to submit ideas related uh, to the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion that you would like to see addressed uh, in this speaker series in the future. And we invite you too to uh, suggest names of individuals you'd like to see uh, as we still have four more to uh, schedule and, and uh, get on board. We hope to see you all again next month. We plan to announce the speaker and the date and time for uh, November very shortly. And again, we appreciate it. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you.